Hi, my name's Chris Croft, and I'm recording this specially for John Chisholm of Crescente. And this is going to be a session where we're going to look at how do you manage remote individuals and remote teams. And I think the dilemma when you're thinking about management style with people who are working remotely is how do we give them maximum involvement while they're working remotely and maximum freedom because that's better for their motivation but also maintain control. So it's this compromise between freedom and control that we need to think about. And I think when you're analysing your leadership style, there are two main parts to it. And the first part is the planning. How much do you involve them in the planning? And the degree of involvement really depends on the the do that again. And the degree of involvement really depends on the amount of expertise they've got. Because if they don't know very much at all, you pretty much have to tell them what the plan is. But if they're really expert, then you can delegate it to them. So I think there are three levels of involvement that you can choose between when you're dealing with remote people. And the first one is what I call consult. So this is where you say to them, this is my plan. What do you think? So it's really only slightly better than just telling them the plan. But at least you say to them, what do you think? Because there might be a flaw in your plan that you didn't think of. And you might as well run it past them and they will feel good about that. So that's consulting. It's pretty much your plan, but they have a chance to have a say. You're probably going to get 80 or 90 percent of your plan. The only snag with consulting, by the way, is if you consult and they suggest changes and the suggestions are not very good, you might have to say to them, well, thanks for the suggestions, but I'm going to ignore them. And that doesn't always look very good. But nine times out of ten, they will spot any minor flaws because they know the detail of the job uh, in it more precisely than you do. And so it is a good idea to run the plan past them. Now, the second option when you're thinking about the amount of involvement in the planning is what I would call sharing the plan. And this is where you have a Zoom meeting with them and you say, let's just sit down and work out how we're going to do this. So you work with them, and this might be with an individual one-to-one, -one, or you might be joining in with a team of people, and you might be you and say five of them. So you might only get a sixth of the input, and you jointly solve the plan. And I think this will probably give you the best quality of plan, but it's quite time consuming. But it's a great bit of involvement. When people are working from home, they start to feel quite detached from what's going on, and they love it if they can be involved in some of the planning. The third option, if they're really competent, or if you're not very competent in an area, is to delegate. And so you can delegate all of the planning to them and just say, this is the problem, you do it. And again, you could be delegating to one person or you could be delegating to a whole group of people as a team and they're just going to do it. So those are the three levels of involvement when you're planning. Now, the second part of all this is the doing the carrying out of the plan. And here, it's not so much about involvement, it's about how much freedom do you give. And this really depends on how much you trust them. Can you trust them just to get on and do it? And remember, they're working from home, so you can't see what they're doing. At least in the office, you can walk past and just see how it's getting on. But if they're working from home, they might be doing absolutely nothing and you wouldn't know. I'm just going to check that it's recording. <laughs> These are the things we worry about. Yes, it is. Good. And back in the room. So I think there are three levels of freedom. And the first level of freedom would be check before you do anything. So before you spend any money or before you talk to a customer, before you send a document to the customer, let me see it. Now that is very low risk because nothing bad's going to get to the customer. No money is going to be wasted. The only thing that's going to be wasted is the person's time. Because when I check it and go, oh no, no, you can't send that, then they've wasted a certain amount of time. But it's minimal risk really. So you've got 
checking before. Especially if you've delegated to a good person, it's pretty unlikely that they're going to have wasted all of their time. You might want to make one or two tweaks, but of course you've got to try to resist interfering too much with what people do. Because it's very easy to look at something and think, well, I wouldn't have done it like that, but maybe it's fine. So there is a rule which says delegate at 80%. So if they can do it 80% as well as you, give it to them. Because that last 20% is probably in your head. It's probably fine. It's just different to how you would have done it. So let it go. Clearly, if they can only do it 30% as well as you, don't give it to them. And if you give it to them by mistake, when you check before, you're going to discover that and you're going to learn not to delegate something as difficult as that to them next time. You could delegate them easier things and gradually build up. So checking before is the maximum amount of control that you can have. And you could have a weekly meeting with them and just check what they're, what they're going to say to customers this week. Or you could say, contact me, just email me or whatever, send me an instant message and I'll just approve it before you do it. So they need to know that that's the rule. The second level of uh, freedom and trust is report after. So this is where you say to them, do what you like, but just keep me informed. And if you want to negotiate a better price from that supplier or that customer, just go for it. But let me know so that I know what's happening. <coughs> so that's reporting afterwards. And that's much easier for them because they don't have to get hold of you every time. They can just get on with it. And it's better for you as well because you don't get endless little requests. And this reporting afterwards... You could do it once a week, so you could have a weekly Zoom meeting with individuals or with the team, and you could just find out what they've been up to. Or it could even be monthly. They could just send you a monthly summary of, you know, these are the hours we've worked, or these are the meetings they've had with customers, or whatever. So, so you can decide, and you basically decide how much freedom you want to give them. So let's suppose that you've only just moved them from check before to reporting after. You could check every day. So you could say, at the end of each day, just send me a summary of what you've done, the quotes you've sent or whatever it might be, the things that you've purchased. And then they can only go wrong by a day's worth, which is not too risky. It's only a little bit more risky than checking before, isn't it? Check after, but every day. They can only go wrong by a day's worth. And similarly, if you check weekly, they could go wrong by a week's worth. Monthly, you're really giving them quite a lot of freedom. And you can gradually increase this. So in a way, these are not three boxes along here. In a way, this is a sliding scale. And then the ultimate freedom is where they don't have to check at all. They're free to act. And they just get on with it. And they only come to you if they're stuck. So they basically just do it. And remember, people can be free to act for small, easy things. And then they can be checking before for the big things. So a sort of jokey example I use is that the person who comes to clean the toilets in your office is free to act. You know, they don't have to check before and think of using the curly brush today. Is that all right? And they don't have to report afterwards. Oh, you should have seen what was in the second one along. Oh, it took me half an hour. You know, we don't need to know that, do we? You're free to act. You know how to do it. Just do it. So ironically, high status people are quite often checked before because it's big things they're doing, negotiating big contracts or, you know, agreeing to big projects or something like that. Whereas often lower status jobs, people are free to act. Just get on with it. You know how to do it. Just do it. So we judge the level of freedom depending really on how much we can trust the person. And that trust is not based on dishonesty, it's based on competence. You know, is there a risk that they might make a mistake and not know that they've made it? So we've got nine combinations and you might think that that's a bit complicated, but actually it's not too bad because four of them are impossible. So we can get rid of those. So let's just look at the ones that we can rule out. And first of all, we can rule out these two. And that's because if I've come up with the plan and I've just checked it with you and you've agreed it, I don't need you to check before you do each part. Shall I do the next bit now? Because I already know what the plan is. It's my plan, so you can do it. And similarly, if we've jointly come up with the plan, you don't need to check with me before each part. But if I've delegated the job to you, then I probably do want you to just check each part with me before you do it, because I haven't seen the plan yet. So you're saying to me, OK, I'm going to do this next, Chris. And then I can say, OK, sounds good. Go for it. So really, you only want to check before if it's delegate. 
and don't need these. These are too controlling. I mean, use them if you like, but I can't imagine why you would want to be that controlling. At the opposite extreme, down here, we've got another combination that I wouldn't recommend. And I think this is not controlling enough. When you're dealing with remote teams, now at work, in the office, you can do this because we have management by walking about. So at work, you can say to somebody, I'm delegating this job to you, just do it. And you're free to act, just get on with it. Because every now and then you can wander past their desk and see how it's going. But I think if somebody's working from home, that's just too out of control because you're not going to know anything about what's happening. You don't know what the plan is and you don't know what they've done on the plan. So it seems to me really that this one needs to either be here where we talk about the plan a bit together first and then you just get on with it. Or it needs to be this way a little bit where I delegate the plan to you, but you at least tell me after you've done each part. So you might be colouring in a Gantt chart or something like that. So I know how the progress is getting on. So I think that one is unfortunately not feasible for people who are working from home. Now, there's one other combination that I don't recommend for people who are working from home, and that's this top right here. Now, top right would seem OK because I'm being quite controlling on the plan, but I'm letting you just carry it out freely. But I don't think this is a great combination. I'll, I'll confess here, actually, that this is my own particular poison. This is the one that I tend to do when I'm in charge of people. And it's bad. I admit that. Because what I tend to do is I tend to have a really strong idea of what I want the plan to look like. So I tend to go for consult and say, this is my plan. But I don't even always ask people what they think. I just say, this is the plan. But if I'm being good, I'll say, this is the plan. What do you think? Uh, and, and then when I give it to them, they're free to act because I can't bear to watch. Because as a control freak, when they're doing it, I really have the urge to interfere. I think I just can't watch them do that because that's not how I would do it. So I quite often have a plan, give it to them, and I just walk away and I can't look. And that's really this. And, and the problem is that they may well not follow the plan the way I wanted it. So I'm thinking that if you're going to come up with a plan, probably the best thing to do is get them to just report after each bit. So here's my plan, you do it, but after each bit, just check that, you know, just let me know how you're getting on so I can monitor the progress. I wouldn't leave them free to act completely. If they're not good enough to be involved in the planning, they're not good enough to be free to act in the carrying out. Now, if they are a good person, and they are good enough to let them be free to act, then I think you should at least share the planning with them. And I think it's a wasted opportunity if you don't involve them in the planning. So let's look at the five options that we do have. And by the way, you don't have to really memorise these five and think about it, although you could do. What I'd recommend doing is just think, how much involvement am I going to have on the solving of the problem, on the planning? And then how much freedom am I going to give them on the doing? And just see where you end up on this chart. And if you end up as a three or a five or something, that's fine. But as long as you know where they're going to be on the chart and you make sure they know where they are on the chart, everyone knows where they are, and then that's great. And generally, you want to ask yourself, could I move downwards on here? So could I involve them more in the planning? Because you'll get a better plan and they'll be more motivated. And can I move across on here? because you'll get more time and they'll get more motivation if they can just get on with it. So generally you want to go this way and this way, but not right into this corner. So just think about this and think about this and then have a look and see whether you end up in one of my forbidden four places where you don't want to be. If you do find yourself in these two, by the way, then I would be thinking either um, if I'm going to check before they do it, why don't I just delegate it to them or um, if I'm going to consult them on the plan, why don't I just let them get on with it and just check every week? Why do they have to check before when I've agreed the plan? And similarly, if it's a shared plan, why don't they just tell me how they're getting on? I don't need to check before. So, decide where you're going to be here, decide where you're going to be here, and that tells you what you've got. But let's look at these five, because I think we could characterise each of the five as a management style. And the first one I would call split. And the reason for this is because I think there's, when you're using this style here, which is where 
I come up with the plan, let's say I'm the boss, I, I come up with the plan, you do it, but you just let me know how you're doing. There's a split between the thinking and the doing. So this is where I'm the thinker with the, with the, um, with the expertise in that area. So I come up with the plan, but then I give it to some really good, trustworthy people to do it. So I'm imagining something like a bunch of people digging up the road. So they're the ones who do it, but I'm the one who plans which pipes we're going to do in August and which ones we're going to do in September and all that. And then I give the instructions and they're the ones who do it. And they just report afterwards of how it's getting on. There's some way to monitor the progress. But I don't think style number one is brilliant because I think ideally you'd involve those people in the planning. But sometimes they can't be involved in the planning. Uh, or maybe they're not able to be involved in the planning for some logistical reason or they just don't understand the planning but they're very good at digging the hole. So if there's a split between the planning and the doing, then you've got situation number one, and that can happen. Now, situation number two, I, I'm gonna call big. This is what I would use for any really big job. But also, I think this is my go-to style. This would be my starting default choice, as it were. So suppose I was gonna open a new office in Scotland or something like that. I would share with my team how should we do it and are we going to do it build it in Edinburgh or Glasgow and what do we want to do do we want to have a manager from down here or should we have everybody Scottish and all those sort of you know, big decisions we would make I'd want to share those decisions not make it myself and not delegate it because I would want to have some input in it and then I think in terms of managing the progress reporting after is the one that I like best and whether it's daily weekly or monthly I would decide the level of control but that would be my default choice, I think, for something big. Now, sometimes you might want to go to number three, and I'm going to call this one expert. Because sometimes you, you share the plan and then you don't even have to monitor the progress. So let's suppose, for example, that we've got a new piece of software. We might jointly design what, what it's going to do. But then once the software people start writing it, there's no point in me saying to them, so, you know, how much have you done so far? Because I'm probably not even going to understand that part of it. And I might as well trust them and let them get on with it. If they're really trusted and they've been, they're good people and we've done projects before and I know I can trust them, I might as well just let them get on with it uh, and not even monitor. Now, I'm a bit of a control freak. I quite like a Gantt chart or something where I can monitor. But that does waste a bit of my time and it does imply to them that I don't entirely trust them. So I think sometimes, you know, when they really are experts, you might want to go for number three. And the only advantage of number three, by the way, over this one here, is that at least I can have a share in the planning. So quite often I do have an opinion on what I want, or I can add some value to the planning. You know, if I'm, if I'm a bit of an expert on a subject, but the people who work for me are also experts, how do I delegate? And the answer is, maybe I should delegate it to them and just let them get on with it. But I might just want to have a little bit of input into the planning because I've got some knowledge as well. And between us, we can come up with a brilliant plan and then they just do it. So that's situation three. Of course, this is a sliding scale. So what you might do is report after only monthly or six monthly. Or there might be some routine reporting, like just say a budget or something like that. So you can monitor with a very light touch. It's almost completely just free to act. Now, we've got two more styles down here. Um, and number four, I would say, is when you're testing someone. So, for example, I was asked to do a talk for some people in India about positive thinking. And they said to me, we want you to design a talk. We don't know, you know, just design something that's good. But could you just tell us a bit about it before the day? And I was thinking, oh, don't you trust me? You know, I, I, I do this all the time. I'm an expert. But of course, they didn't trust me because they didn't really know me. And my talk could have been rubbish or it might have been well off track. It might not have been relevant to their company or there might have been jokes in there that were totally unsuitable or something. So because they didn't really know me, they wanted to check beforehand. And I think that's fine. So they delegated it to me and they gave me freedom, but they just wanted to check it beforehand. So I think if you've got somebody relatively new, but who seems good, why not give them the job to do, but just check it first? 
And you might have somebody actually who isn't new, who's worked with you for quite a long time, but you're giving them something they haven't done before. Maybe they're not very motivated and you're going to give them a bit of a test and you're going to say, look, I'm going to trust you with something new. Would you like to take on this challenge? But just to check that things are OK, <coughs> I think it'd be a good idea just to check before they start. And you might want to check the whole plan. And once you've seen it, say, brilliant, do it. Or you might want to say just with each part of the plan as you go along, just check it with me before you send anything to the customer or before you spend money. So that's a really safe way to delegate. And then after a while, if they do well on each job you give them, you can move them up to number five. And by the way, you might have somebody at number five, but you might still give them um, a, a, a number four management style when you give them something big. So the small stuff they can report after, or even free to act maybe, Whereas the big stuff they need to check beforehand. So obviously a person can be in more than one box and quite possibly a person could be in lots of these boxes depending on what type of task it is. So the final one is number five and I would say this is for complete stars. These are the people you can delegate it to them. You don't have to check it beforehand. They just report as they go along. So if you've got somebody who's really good, just give them the job. And just say every week or every month, just give me a quick summary of where you're at, just so I know in case anybody asks. And I think that's that's great. Now, what's the difference between number five and number three? And I think number three is where you want to have a share of the planning because you actually have got something to say. Whereas with number five, it's really where they know more than you do. And you think, well, I can't add to the planning. I mean, this person's an expert and I'm not. It might be that you know nothing about it, so you have to delegate it. But then you just keep a track as they go along. Whereas this one, you've had an input into the planning, so then you don't have to keep a track as they go along because they're a trustworthy person. So they're kind of trustworthy in both, but you've got to have some control either at the planning stage or at the monitoring of the doing. Because remember, these people are working remotely so you won't know anything that they're doing if you don't have some control of either the planning or the doing. So I think you've got five combinations there. And really, we want people to be in three or five. But I think two is my go to. And then after a while, if they do really well, I might move them from two to three or I might move them from two to five and not even have any input into the planning. So that is a structured way to look at varying your management style, depending on the person and the job, when they're working remotely. And this could be for teams or for individuals. And I just wanna add two more quick points to the end here. And the first one is, it could go up as well as down. So you could use this for managing upwards to your boss. And you can suggest the management style that you want your boss to use on you. So you could say to your boss, could I have a share in the planning of this rather than you doing it? Because I'd like to have a say and I do know a bit about it and I think I could help. Or you could say, why don't you delegate it to me? Now, if it's too late, you could say maybe next time you could just give it to me or maybe next time I could have a share. But you can suggest to your boss that they move down here and that they give you more and more of the of the planning work. <coughs> and by the way, you can sell it to them by suggesting that it will save them time. So you can say, look, it's much quicker for you if you just delegate it to me. Just give it to me, I can do it. And you can check before I do anything. So don't worry, it'll be totally safe. So you can suggest going from here to here and say, look, give it to me, but I'll check with you before I talk to the customer and I'll check with you before I spend any money. So you can suggest your boss moves this way and you can also suggest your boss moves that way. So you could say to them, but rather than me checking beforehand every time, which is very time consuming, sometimes I can't get hold of you and it's endless little meetings. I have to check. It's holding up the progress of the project. Why don't I just do it? But I'll tell you immediately after I've done each thing. So you'll always know and I can only go wrong by one thing. Or well, why don't we have a daily meeting or a weekly meeting? Or why don't I just send you an email every day or every week where I just let you know what's been going on and what I've been doing? And if I send you an email every day, I can only go wrong by a day's worth. And I won't. You know I won't. I've done loads of jobs for you before. They've always been fine. So you can suggest that your boss moves from checking before you do stuff to reporting after. 
And that will save you a lot of hassle, but it will save your boss a lot of hassle as well. And then finally, if you're on number two, you could suggest going to number three and saying, instead of reporting after every day, why don't we make it weekly? Instead of weekly, why don't we make it monthly? And then after that, you could say, you know, why don't you just let me do it? And I'll come to you if there's any problem. I always do anyway, you know that. But rather than having to check on me all the time, just let me do it. You can spend your time focused on the more risky, more difficult other projects that other people are doing. So you can use this to suggest your boss moves. In fact, you might decide to ask the boss to move the other way. So you could say, actually, this job you're delegating to me, I'd quite like us to work on it jointly because I don't feel I know enough about it to do it all on my own. And I'd really value your input. So you might decide to go from here to here. And similarly, you might say to the boss, why don't I just check a couple of things beforehand? Because there's a couple of things that I haven't done before and they're quite big and quite risky. And rather than do it and get it wrong, I'd quite like to check first. So sometimes you might want to go the other way. But the point is you can choose the style that your boss uses on you. And then the final thing I want to say about this is that it should be um, an open process, a transparent process. So management isn't something that you secretly do to other people without them realising. Management should be something where you agree the process with your boss. So if you're a manager, you should say to somebody, I want to um, involve you a bit in the planning. So let's share rather than, uh, rather than consulting. Or I'd like to delegate this one to you because I think you're knowledgeable enough to be able to do it on your own without me. What do you think? And then you could say to them, rather than checking before, you know, every time you do your work, it's always great. I think we should move to checking after. But because I'm a bit of a control freak, could we check once a week just so that I can feel happy? Um, but at least you can just get on with it. So you agree they're going to move from here to here. And then perhaps at some point in the future, you say, just go for it. Just come to me with problems if you have any of those. But apart from that, you don't need to report every time. And that will save us both time. So you can tell them where they are on this. So management style isn't something secret you do to people without them realising. You absolutely should tell them where they are on here and agree it and check that they're happy. And if they want to influence you to move further across or further down, good luck to them. Maybe they're right. So it's a transparent process. So there we are. That's a structured way of thinking about your management style with remote teams. And I hope you find it useful. So that's it from me. I hope you found that useful and I hope to see you again on a future video.